Amen. Thank you so much, Christian and Christina, for that prayer and for the announcements. Uh, good morning, Expression 58. It's so good to be with you uh, this morning. I want to start with letting you know also that we are starting church online. Uh, in a, we are bringing our Facebook group online, and we are going to be um, building up starting today. We are doing, we've been working on some changes, and the plan is to be able to use our Facebook group to equip you better, to give you more resources and how to grow in your faith. And also, a huge part of what we're trying to do with this is create a safe sp space where you can invite friends and family, uh, maybe people who don't have the, the possibility to come to a church or don't feel comfortable going to a church, but they can start uh, to go on a journey of discipleship and understanding the ways of Christ uh, through a Facebook page. And so if you, um, not, you're you not a part of our Facebook group, this is the close group. I want to make sure that you sign up to that. Uh, there is, you know, when you go on a Expression 58 church, just go to the visit group and make sure you sign so you can benefit from what we're going to be doing uh, online. Uh, I believe that this is another way where we can create connection. Obviously, we are we're praying and believing for uh, for uh, the return of, of meeting together. Uh, we missed everybody, and we can't wait to be able to go back to our normal services. And this is something that can live on. And uh, one of the reasons we put in energy in this is because we believe that this is going to supplement uh, during the week and uh, at times where you cannot attend uh, you can also connect with us online. So we're so excited. Uh, there's there's a lot that uh, we're we're building towards that. It's going to be really good. Well, before I start today, this morning, I want to take a moment and just I want I want to invite you to to pray with me, for especially the the West Coast, as we've been just having just this crazy amount of fires and we can see the quality of air just all on the west coast it's so horrible uh, we're just going to pray for that and and pray that god will have mercy and release uh, rain and just stop the fire so holy spirit we come uh, together today god and we, we we ask for for the west coast god for california oregon god we pray for you to come and release god Release rain over these areas. God, I pray, Lord, that you will release winds to clear the air, God. Purify the air. God, I pray, Lord, that uh, everybody that's affected by this, God, I just pray for protection and covering. Everybody who's breathing this air right now, God, we just pray for covering and protection. But I pray that anything that's causing destruction in the season, God, we will cease now. God, we know that there's nothing impossible for you, God. So we come to you today, God, believing, God, for a change and for a stop of these fires. God, I pray, God, for every person that is working towards helping all the fire workers, God, everybody that's uh, working on this, God, we just pray for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, family, I'm excited to be with you this morning. Um, the title of my message is Running the Race. And um, we're going to jump in. Praying about this, you know, there's some very specific God, uh, things that God was speaking to me. Um, and, and there's there's important things that we need to, to be able to run the race well. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over some of these points. But I'm going to start with the first two. You know, to be able to run the, the race that we're called to, to run. We need to heal from our injuries, and we need to stop falling. And I'm going to hit those two because uh, as, as, uh, I'm actually going to go over Hebrews 12 as I talk about this, and, and we're going to hit these two uh, first. Heal from our injuries and stop falling. You know, in Hebrews 12, it's talking about how we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. You know, in verse 1 starts, we're surrounded with all these people who run the race before us, right? Like the, run, the, 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 the race of faith. And, you know, we know that it is the one thing that counts. In Galatians 5, it talks about the one thing that counts. It's faith expresses itself through love. So 
these people have gone before us. And now we're surrounded with this cloud of witnesses that in heaven, they're expecting and watching how we run this race, right? All the brothers and sisters who have gone before us. They're cheering us from heaven. And it says, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we have easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination for the path has been already marked out before us. So we need to let go, right, of any wound that has pierced us. Anything that we had experienced that is not allowing us to run the way we're supposed to. God wants us to run with passion and determination. This race, as Christians, we should be some of the most determined people and some of the most passionate people. This is how we're supposed to run. But the wounds that we carry, you know, if you're wounded, you can't really run well when you're wounded, right? It's, 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 it's pretty hard. You know, I, I just got a cut on my finger. And it's actually, a, it's, I mean, it's, it, I didn't cut my whole finger off. But I did cut a huge part of the nail. And it went through. And it was actually kind of deep, Right? And in just a small cut in your in a finger, it just it, it, it's just amazing how like you know even taking a shower is a little harder, you know. And so spiritually, if you think about it, if we're just full of wounds, right? If our body is just hurting all over, like you cannot run well when you are wounded. And and the enemy is always looking in uh, for a place where they can he can find agreement with offense and 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 keep us in a place where we're wounded and bleeding, you know. And 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 for me, like even just to stop the bleeding, right? I had to hold this for a while, I, and I had to put pressure and I had to do things so it would stop bleeding. And it's just a small cut, but it makes a big difference. But there's also, as Christians, we were given responsibility, right? And I caught myself because I was playing chef, right? And I had a big knife, and it's a new knife, and I was excited with my new knife. And I was just chopping really fast, right? Like a chef, you know, because the chefs, they chop in a certain way. And so I was going the chef way. And so I was going real fast, but then, you know, my daughter is, it, it was, it was doing some school, and, and I got distracted for one second. You know, I, I just look up. And uh, in that moment, I cut my finger, you know. And there's, it's amazing, but I feel like as Christians, we don't realize sometimes the responsibility we have. And as we grow, you know, we, we, we become um, more responsible, right? I, I'm not going to give that knife to any of my kids because I know what can happen, right? But I'm supposed to be the mature one here. I'm, I'm the adult. I shouldn't be cutting my finger, right? But, but even like not being focused... You know, you can, you can cause some, some unnecessary pain on yourself when you lose your focus. And so, so now it's time to heal the wound. Let's heal the places in our hearts. You know, God can help us to heal these places in our heart. The amazing thing is that we have the Holy Spirit that can heal us as we open ourselves to God. As we put everything before him, he can, he can bring the healing. And it says, right, we're going to have to let go of the sin that easily fall, that we easily fall into. We need to be determined. We need to remember how important the race is. Like, they, we don't have time. Like, I just look at what's happening in the world right now, and I just think about, I was like, there's a level of just this, this, this uh, importance that as the church, that we take our place. Because we are looking at a world that's scared, that is worried, that is in fear, who's hopeless, right? We need to take our place as the church. This is not time to be playing with sin, like, or just, just letting little things hold on to us, right? Let's break the things that are causing us to stay in cycles of sin so we can run well. It's like running with a lot of weight on top of you. You know, that doesn't work very well. You know, I, I yeah, just just a backpack, you know, uh, of, of a few things. Like, you know, you're not going to be able to run like everybody else if you're just holding a heavy backpack. 
So we need to let go of those things. And then it says, for the path has been already marked for us. We need to run the right race. So that's number three. Run the right race. Okay? I think many times the problem is that we're not running the right race. We're getting tired running all the races. And now we don't have strength to run the race that we need to run. Or we're getting hurt running all the races when we're supposed to prepare him for this race. As Christians, we have a path that was made for us. You know, um, when you know, kids play sports, right? One of my sons, he's playing basketball. He was so excited. Right before basketball season, he's messing around playing football with his friends, right? And he injured himself and, and broke Broke a bone. So now he, he, who could, he couldn't play. He couldn't train for his basketball season because he had a broken bone. And so, you know, many times I feel like we so easily get distracted and we start running the run race. We start, we, and we actually get hurt uh, doing things that, that we shouldn't be doing in the season. It, it, we, it's important that we, we, we are focused in the season. You know, if I think anything that's going to cause your heart to expand, to be healthy, to prepare for what you want to do, that's good, right? So I actually think, like, a lot of sports are good. You know, if you're playing basketball, play soccer too. Like, you know, like, those things are going to give you condition and stuff like that. Now, football, you know, my wife it was very adamant that we didn't want our kids to play football because they get hurt really easy, right? And so... So we, we need to look at, like, wh what's important for us right now? What are we protecting right now? And I feel like many Christians are running other races, right? Be about the race that we need to be at. Like, don't, don't get distracted with other things. You know, and, and let, let the, the, the main race, the main race be the focus in the season. Run the right race. You know, in John 14, 6, uh, Jesus says, right, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father. Only through me. Because I am the path. I am the way. So Jesus is the path, right? Our race, it's a race of becoming like Christ. That's a race. Our race looks different than most races. Our race is about Becoming more like Christ every day. He is the path. He is the way. Verse 2. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze unto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who lead us forward into faith's perfection. So he birthed faith in us, right? The race is, is a faith, is a race of love, because he is love. And running that race is going to look like servanthood, because he came as a servant. He came to show us how to run the race. He came to show us what does it look to be a son, what does it look to be a son and a daughter of God. He is the example. And we can see with his example that he came and served. He gave himself, right? There's no greater love than the one, the one who gives his life for his own friends. He was sacrificial in his love. So are we running the right race? Or are we getting distracted with other things? Are we getting tired with other things? Having the right focus is so important. If Jesus is not the focus, we have a problem. Right? When things go crazy in the world and we start just thinking a lot about end times, we have a problem. He is the focus. Right? Are we in the end times? Probably. And we've probably been in the end times for the last thousand years. Right? So who cares? And stay focused on Jesus because it's not going to help you just to be thinking about is it really, really the end times? Yes, it is. But it's been for a thousand years. It could be for another 5,000, 10,000. Who knows? Right? Nobody knows. It's very clear. The Bible is super clear about that. So run the race. You need to be found doing the things that you're supposed to be doing.
His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you will be his. Right? Jesus said that he ran his race and his race was an, an easy race. His race was a hard race. It was challenging. It was painful. But he said that he was able to run his race because he was focused on the joy of knowing that you will be his. He was, he was focused on restoration. He was focused on union. He was focused on family. He was fo- focused on love. Right? He was able to run his race because he was focused. He remembered why he was running. He didn't just remember. He knew. Right? So we need to remember. And we need to know why we run. Why are we running this race? You know, he was able to endure the agony of the cross. He conquered his, he said that he conquered its humiliation. And now he sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So we may experience pain in the race. But there's resurrection power on the other side. There is union with God on the other side. There is a transformation of becoming more like him in the other side. Remember why you run. Number five, embrace correction. Okay, so this one is a hard one. You know, we don't, we don't like correction many times, most of the time. I'm going to just go down like verse 5 says, My child, don't under, underestimate the value of the discipline and training of the Lord God. Or get depressed when he has to correct you. For the Lord's training of your life is the evidence of his faithful love. And when he draws you to himself, he proves you are his delightful child. So embrace correction. Now, to me, this is something that we always talked about here, the importance of being teachable, right? But it, this is hard because usually um, we can out to correct. When we out to correct, you know, it's, it's, most people can do some of that, right? Like there's, it's, but there, there's certain areas in our life that are very hard to change, And God knows that we are not going to be able to run the race well if we don't learn, right, how to run right. I've I've seen some kids that just naturally are not very athletic. And it just looks like they're going to fall any time when they run. I don't know if you've seen this. And especially when kids are like, like one and a half and two, have you seen how they run? If you run like those kids right now as an adult, it would just look very weird. And it, 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 will, it will make people just uh, uncomfortable, you know, just because it's cute when they're one and a half or two. But when you're a grown person, you run like that. It, it's, it's, it's a little concerning. And um, I feel like many times we're just the way that we run, right? Because the way that we run is so important for Christians. Because it's really is the testimony of who God is when we're running. And so God has to come and say, like, hey, God, you know, this is actually how you run. And this is how you breathe. And this is how, you know, you're just going to fall if you run like this. You know, you, and you need to look forward. Don't run looking backwards. You know, like there's all these things that I think we're doing that is causing us to run weird. And we're looking like, like toddlers running this race. And God wants to correct how you run because, because he wants you to run the, 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 the race well. And it's because he delights in you. He loves you. Now, I think one of the reasons why this is hard is because I feel like the church has done a, a pretty bad job with correction. You know, we, we don't have a great history of how do we correct people when they're not running well. We don't have a great history of that. And I think a lot of people are hurt 
some of the wounding that we need to get healed from is just the way that we've been corrected in church. But the reality is that we cannot just drop that because we had some bad experiences. We actually have to figure out a healthy way of embracing correction. And verse 9 says, And isn't it true that we respect our earthly fathers, even though they correct and discipline us? Then we should demonstrate an even greater respect for God, our spiritual father, as, as we submit to his, to his life-giving discipline. Many times when there's something that's causing correction in our life, you know, many times we get offended at God, or we complain, or we get depressed. But this is saying like, hey, no, no, remember, like every, even, even our, our earthly parents, they tried to correct us because they loved us, right? And, and even more God, like we need to honor God even when we're being disciplined, when we're being corrected by God. We need to honor God. The posture of our heart, it's important. You know, in this, it's very important that we learn how to invite people to, to speak into our lives. Yes, we need the Holy Spirit to bring conviction. And this is something that we should always pray. God, will you convict me of anything that, that I need to be convicted of, right? Like there's always things that sometimes we don't realize. And we want to live with a spirit of conviction. We want to do things out of conviction. We want to run with conviction, right? Because it's, we, want, we want this to be real. Many, it's easy to fake things. And if you've been in the church for a long time, you can fake everything. You can look like the perfect worship leader, the perfect couple, the perfect pastor, the perfect every. You can look perfect, and that doesn't mean that you're living out of conviction. So it's easy to learn how to fake if you've been in the church for a long time. So how do we live out of conviction? And then invite people. There should be people in your life that actually challenge you to a higher standard who challenge you when you're lacking honor, when you're lacking, uh, when you're just living out of fear or whatever it is. You need people to speak into your life, right? Don't just expect that people are going to come out of nowhere and just tell you when you're, you're doing that. You should already have people in your life. And if, if you haven't told somebody in a long time, hey, I want you to keep me on check. I want you to speak to me. If you see that I'm like off about something like, I want you to know that you have, you have that space to speak to my life. We need to have that attitude because I, I think a huge part of why even just in our society we see people just going off the rails is because they, they have not people with sane minds that are telling them, hey. And then, and then they're, they don't, they're not listening to anybody, right? They just do their own thing. And that was not what, this is not how it's supposed to be. Right? That we need to be able to, to walk with each other. So do that. Get some people to speak into your life. If you have people who are discipling you, people, remind them, hey, by the way, you have, you have the space to speak into my life. If you see something off, you know, you're welcome to share those things. We need to be a safe place for people to, to walk these things. But, you know, I, and we need to encourage people, but also we need to speak the, the truth in love. Right? If there's something that needs to be said, let's say those things so people can grow. You know, it says in verse 11, Now all discipline seems to be more pain than pleasure at a time. Yet later it will produce an, a transformation of character, bringing a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who yell to it. So you actually have to yell to it, right? You need to be able to say, God, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to think differently. I'm willing to receive new ideas. Open my mind. Open my heart. I want to be teachable. Number six. Strengthen your weak knees. And verse 12 says, so be, so be made strong, even in your weakness, by lifting up your tired hands in prayer and worship and strengthening your weak knees. 
What does that mean? Now, when I think about weakness, I think about fear. If you've ever experienced just terrifying fear, is you feel like your, wigs, your, 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 your knees are just giving, giving out, right? It's like you feel like you can't stand. Or you feel paralyzed. You have weak knees. It's like if, if you want to be a good runner, you have to have some strong knees, right? You're not going to be able to. The impact of running is going to be too much if you're doing things out of fear. We were never supposed to do things out of fear as Christians. Fear should never be our boss. Fear should never be what dictates what we do and what we don't do as Christians, right? The amazing thing is that if we, we have to remember that we're running with Christ. This is not where his, the yoke is, is, is light because he's with us. So as hard as it is, it's still light somehow because he's with you. You know, I, I have memories that when I was very young, and I, remember, I have memories of my dad putting me on his shoulders. And just the feeling of, of just feeling so tall and so high and so safe. You know, and I just, I used to always just think about how tall my dad was, right? As a kid, you have that, that memory. And um, we forget who our father is. We forget who, who, who is the one who is carrying us in this race, it's time that we remember those things because fear should never be dictating in our decisions. And I feel like so much of what we do in our day is caused by fear. We're running a race of faith and fear comes in complete opposition to faith. We cannot run this race holding on, holding on to fear. It is time that we face our fear. He is with us. We're more than overcomers with him. Verse 13 says, For as you keep walking forward on God's path, all your stumbling ways will be divinely healed. So it's giving you these things, these steps. Of These are things that you need to do. And as you do these things, then there's also a grace that comes over your life. Right? And there's divine healing in your life. You know, there's things, many times I, you think, man, there's no way I can change this. They have, this has been my problem my whole life. But you know what? There is a way. And God gives us sometimes just simple steps that we need to take. Maybe you're missing one of those things. Maybe you need somebody speaking to your life. Maybe somebody needs to know that you struggle with something. Right? Maybe, maybe you just need to heal from some wounds. Whatever it is, just Embrace these things because God wants you to run with passion and determination. This race is incredible. This grace is, it, it will give you so much joy and fulfillment. You know, there's something about when you enjoy something and when you do something with passion, like you feel so good, right? Like even in your natural body. The same thing happens spiritually. If you learn how to do this, right, run in this race. Even when you're going up and when you're going down, when you're, it doesn't matter where you are in the race. There's going to be fulfillment that you're going to experience in this race. You're going to feel the virtue of God in you. Number seven, honor God. Now, all the other points had like a, you know, a meaning with like a natural race. But honoring God, the reason I put honoring God is because the reality is, is that you need a strong heart to be able to run well. Having a healthy heart, but not just healthy from your wounds, but a heart that has trained, right? If you, if, if you heard the doctors, like when they, if somebody has a really good heart, they say like, oh, it's like the heart of a runner, right? A strong heart, somebody who has trained, somebody who's been in this and, and, and is devoted themselves to take care of his body and to work hard towards keeping, uh, this is a priority, right? If you're a runner, that's what you do, that you, you train, you do all the things. You make sure that you sleep good. You make sure that you eat well. You make sure that you train constantly, right? So, and then in that, there's health. And the only way we can do this well, this race, because the path is Jesus, 
we always have to carry honor in our hearts. And more important than anything, right? Like we have to honor God in the choices that we're making. Yes, if we honor God, we will honor people the right way. You know? And you can honor people and not be afraid of people, right? The fear of man, that's a problem. But if you honor God truly, you will be able to say no, you know, when, when you feel the pressure of people. And even if they think it's dishonoring, if it's about honoring God, it's, you, you can do it in love. You can do it right. And it looks like, it looks like love, right? And so honoring God. I love it because in verse 14, it switches from not just our own race, but even just, you know, we're running together, right? And, it, and it's like, hey, a healthy heart looks like a heart that cares, a heart that has compassion, a heart that is looking out for your brothers and sisters. It says, in every relationship, be swift to choose peace over competition. And run swiftly towards holiness, for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. So, you know, when you think about a race, we think about, like, winning. We think about, you know, it's, it's competitive. You know, it's just, I want to get there first. But this race is a little bit different. You know, and, and, and the interesting thing is that God and timing, you know, it's, he, God lives in another d- dimension, right? Like, he's just, we're running a race that has eternity attached to it. And so he says here, very, I want you to be swift to choose peace over competition. I think we need to really, really hold on to those things and just reflect and look at the church and look at Christians. So are we doing this? Or are we just trying to be right? Are we trying to point our, uh, prove our points? Are we really peacemakers? Run swiftly to, towards holiness, right? In that place, this is a race where we usually encounter God, that they, they usually experience the revelation of God. As you pursue this, as you honor God, you will be able to see God, honor his ways. Verse 15, watch over each other to make sure that no one misses the revelation of God's grace. And make sure no one lives with a root of bitterness, a spreading within the, which will only cause trouble and poison the hearts of many. Make sure that everybody, everybody understands what grace truly is, right? Like I was saying before, we need to be able to invite people in our life in a way that we're speaking to each other in a healthy way because you can't do this without that you need to have trust you need to ha- you need to have equity to be able to do this but in this it says like make sure right this is very important this is what he's saying like this is very important that you make make sure that everybody's heart are in the right place when you see bitterness in somebody like let's figure out how do we help people are we helping people to become free of bitterness? Or are we just being a part of the problem? Because with all our complaining and all our negativity, we're just making people even more bitter. What are we doing? I think that's a huge problem, right? It's so easy to see the negative. It's a little harder to find solutions. But if we just start like pointing at all the negative all the time, Right? If you see things in the church or whatever that are not done well, but you just constantly just, oh, my goodness, the church, over this, and always that. And, and you don't see the beauty. And, you don't, and, and there's, you know, because you can see problems and at the same time find solutions. That's different. You can start changing things. You can start praying that God will give you the grace to, to, to change the way that we do church. Right? Be open to that. That's, that's good. If you see the problems, you should do that. But if you just complain about it, what's going to happen is like you're just going to make somebody even more bitter. Somebody who's already wounded is going to hear that. And they're just going to, instead of you helping them to become healthier, you're going to push them more into a hole. So what are we doing? 
Are we caring for each other's hearts? Verse 16. Be careful that no one among you lives in immorality. Becoming careless about God's blessings like Isa, who traded away his rights as the firstborn for a simple meal. So you have, it's interesting that the way that immorality is used here in the example that is given is Isa. If you know the story, Isa and Jacob were twin brothers, then Isa was the oldest, right? And the oldest had the blessing of the firstborn. And he got hungry at one point, and he exchanged the blessing that was a, a assigned to him as the firstborn. He exchanged that for a, for a, for a meal, right? So he goes and Jacob, you know, he tells him, hey, Jacob, I mean, Jacob was hungry. He was hungry for the blessing. Was, I don't think what Jacob did was right. I think that Jacob was going to be blessed no matter what. Like Jacob, you know, God already has spoke that Jacob was going to be blessed. And there was hunger in Jacob's heart. But in his hunger, he was still, he didn't do this with honor, right? And so he gets his brother to exchange the blessing of the firstborn for a, for a, for a plate of food. We cannot exchange what's eternal for something that will give us comfort in the moment, but it will not, but it doesn't have any eternity, right? He changed the, to the blessings of God in his life for a, for a meal. And, and, and you see that there was like, God, he says that then he repented and he was so sad and he was, he said that he came and, and cried bitter tears trying to get that back, but it was too late, right? That, that's, this is a serious thing. We cannot, as a church, let go of walking on the blessings of God because a little bit of comfort or because this is easy, you know, just, just to... Just to be able to, I mean, food f makes you feel good, right? Like, I mean, and it's, I'm sure, like, I mean, it was wild deer somewhere and, the, you know, they cook with wood. I bet you the, the stew was amazing, right? And I feel like we wouldn't exchange things if, if there was not things out there that actually were amazing. I think we're, but, but, the, but those amazing things, we need to think about, are we investing what's eternal? Are we investing in what is eternal? And are we hungry for the blessing of God in our lives? Do we want to walk in the grace and favor of God? If you're running this race, you should think about this. Like, I want, this is a race where you should be walking and grow like Jesus did in favor with men and with God, right? You should be thinking about this because this is about being, walking in the blessing of God. When you run this race, you are opening yourself for blessing. We need to be walking towards right relationship with God. And if we do that, it should look like right relationship with people also. Now, uh, there's a picture I have. I want to see if you can put this picture up there um, of a race. And in this race, you have in the front Abel Mutai. He was a, a runner from Kenya. And this is 2012. And behind him, you have uh, Ivan Fernandez. So these two, right, they're running this race. You think about it. This guy, they train for who knows how long, right, for this race. And then now they're on the race. And uh, you come around the last corner, and you have the finish line in 30 meters. And, and, and some of the things were confusing for the, the, the first runner, the Kenyan runner. And he thinks he crossed the finish line. So he starts to slow down, and he starts to greet the people. And, and he's like, we're done, right? Like, the, 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 the race is over. And so the interesting thing that happened here is that the, the, the runner that's coming behind him, Ivan, he can totally take advantage of the situation and pass him. But he realized what, what's happening. He sees that this guy, he realized that the Kenyan thinks that he's, he's finished the race. So he starts screaming at him, right? 
But he says that the guy doesn't understand Spanish, and he's trying English. He doesn't really understand much English, so he's trying to tell him. And so finally, he comes behind him and starts pushing him and telling him and pointing at the finish line, telling him he's not done yet. And just kind of stays behind him until they cross the finish line. It's so interesting because, um, you know, they, they came and they asked Ivan, hey, why did, you, why did you do that? And this is his response. I want you to listen to this. He said, my dream is that someday we can, we can have a kind of community life where we push, push and help each other to win. And then the, the, the guy who's interviewing him said, but why did you let the Kenyan win? And he said, I didn't let him win. He was going to win. The race was his. And then the guy just once again says, but, why could, but you could have won. And this is his response. But what will be the merit of my victory? What will be the honor of my medal? And this is something interesting he said. He said, and what will my mother think of that? Right? I think when I saw this, I just knew that I, this was what I needed to talk about today. Well, actually, when I saw this and I was reading, I, I was already, I already knew that I needed to talk about the race. And then, and then the, I came across this story. And it's so powerful because I believe that, you know, even the, the fact that his name was Abel, right? If you think about Abel in the Bible. His race was cu cut short. His, his own brother took his life. And you have here, this, it, to me, is a picture of like, this is the heart of God. You know, you see the enemy comes to destroy and to kill, right? But God comes to give life and life in abundance. And, and I love that Ivan knew what he was running for. He wasn't just running to win a race. He was, he was, he was carrying conviction. You know when this opportunity has come, he couldn't have first place, right? It's so tempting when situations like this is just, it's just like, well, it's not my fault, right? I, I just run my race and I made it, right? We can think like that. But as Christians, we, we're an expression of who God is. So honoring God, you will honor people, you will honor yourself in, in the process, and I love that you can see that there was a mother, right? There was somebody who put these values in his heart that he was even thinking about it. Man, what would my mother think of that, right? If I would have just take this race from this guy. What's the honor in that? You know, when... When the church becomes a healthy family, we help each other to, to win well. God wants everybody to win. And in the kingdom, we can. Now, I had a dream. I woke up on August 18 with a dream. And I'm going to tell you this dream quickly here. I was... In my dream, I was in Latin America, and I was about to speak. And um, there was like about 3,000 people there. And the interesting thing is that I didn't know what I was going to say at all. And normally, that seems like a horrible dream, right? When you're like about to speak, and you don't know what you're going to talk about. But in this dream, I was in a complete peace. I wasn't worried at all. And I get up to speak. And when I get up to speak, I feel like something connects to my back, and I can feel the heart of God. And I felt like this, like, just all these things started to come out of, out of my mouth. And I was speaking without thinking. And um, that has happened to me a few times in my life. But in, in this dream, you know, I was experiencing this. And, and I started talking about the race. And I was talking about how um, I was very competitive as a kid. And I loved to win. And actually, I won a lot. You know? And I, I, was, I was saying, you know, in my culture, when I was little... You know, it was like, obviously, you, your friends will always make fun of you if you lose. So you always wanted to win. 
But it was the worst kind of humiliation was if you, if you lose, if, if a girl beat you, right? It was like that was the ultimate humiliation. You got, you know, you lost and it was, it was by a girl. A girl beat you. You know, that was like the ultimate. In, in my culture, that, when I was little, that was, that, was, uh, that was the worst thing that can happen to you as a kid. And so I'm talking about this in the stream. And then I said, I start saying, and God has shown me my whole life how this race that we're running is unjust. And what's the, perp- what's, what's the honor in winning something that has been fixed, right? Or has been unjust. And so in my dream, you know, I had this dream before I came into the story. That's what I knew the story was so important. I knew it was God and he was saying something very specific to us. And in my dream, he start, he, he's bringing specific memories to me. The very first one I saw, it's like, it was this memory when I was sitting with street kids that will always beg for, for money or food uh, by the airport. You know, and, and, and he, will, he, he will show me these kids and, just, and he will show me how the race was unjust, right? These kids were starving. They were, they were asking for glue because they were cold, because they were sad, because they were hungry. And, and the glue will help him to cure those things for a moment, Right? And it was like, the race is not fair. Poverty has made the race not fair. You know, then the, the very next memory I had was um, when, when I was in Kenya in a, in a slum. And there was this, this baby. It looked like he was probably like two years old. And he was walking around, but he didn't look right. And I remember we picked him up. And first of all, he was so light He didn't look that skinny, but when we picked it up, he was so light. It felt like he was filled out of air. And I can tell he was so, uh, I can tell he was starving. But he was burning. He was so hot. We're like, this kid is sick. This kid is really sick. And it was so hot outside already. And we're like, this kid needs to get out of the sun. Where's your house? Do you have a bed? It's like, yeah, I have a bed. And, And we, you know, we get to his house. And it, it is literally his dirt, dirt floor. It is one room, and the only thing in this room is this tiny little wooden chair. And so he goes, and he sits on his chair and just kind of leans back, and he's like, this is my bed. And I just remember thinking, and even in this memory, and at that time, it just got to remind me of how I thought. The very thought, first thought that came to my mind was, that could have been me. I could have been born here, and that could have been my story. You know, and when God sees these kids and these situations, he, is, he takes it personal because it's his kids, right? He, care, he gave his life for you and me. He gave his life for every single person who is experiencing injustice. So for that kid, it's going to be very hard to run because there's a lot of things in his life who he's not eating, he's not sleeping right, he's not resting, he is sick. All these things, you can't run well you're, when you're in those conditions, and the interesting thing is that then it went, a lot of the memories had to do with women. The injustice that women experience in the world. And the very first one was when I was in this indigenous community. And I, and I went to the kitchen. I always loved going to the kitchen. And the kitchen was a completely separate room. Same thing, dirt floors. This is way in the middle of nowhere. And they were cooking, uh, uh, making food with real wood and the fire and all these ladies. And I'm joking. I'm like 15, 16 years old. And I'm joking around with them, thinking these old ladies, you know. And I start finding out that they're actually my age. But they look way older because some of them already had two kids. They've been working so hard. And they work and the sun is intense. And, and, and so they just look so much older because they've had to work so hard their whole lives. Um, and they don't have access to a lot of healthy options for food. And I remember after that trip, it was the first, uh, that trip, I was just impacted. And I remember uh, specifically this, this one woman that my parents took her to, to that village. And she was indignated because she found out that this um, this woman works so hard that most of them die in, her, in their 40s. Some of them don't even make it to their 40s. They die so young because they work too hard. And they, you know, they're just, there's not, 
they don't have a healthy environment. And, um, and what happens is that the men have to be married. So if their wife dies, you know, when she's 40, now the husband is probably like in his 40s, the options for, for this, this, this guy to get married again is all these young girls who are like 14 and 15 and 13. And, um, and so, so they marry these young girls, right? And I remember this woman, this friend of my parents, just being so indignated by that. And she was saying, like, this is just so wrong. We need to do something because this, this tribe had become a, a Christian tribe and we have to do something about this. And I remember the response of her husband. And, and I think he was trying to calm her down, but he said, you know what? That's just their culture. Well, there's nothing we can really do about that. Like, that's how they live. But the reality is that kingdom culture, the, the, the culture that we belong to, the kingdom that we belong to, it has a culture. And in that culture, everybody's value. And what God sees these things, these injustices, he actually cares deeply. You know, I, he reminded me of just all these pictures of situations where I've been, where I've seen women have to, pr- have to prove themselves in a way that men have never had to, especially in the corporate world. And, I, and, and these memories of even in ministry, where everybody will get paid the same, and then the girl will pay, get paid less for the same job. Everywhere. You, you see this, this disadvantage. And the guy was saying, like, the race is not fair. And I can feel his heart that he cared about that. And then he reminded me of, 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 a, of this struggle that I have. I remember just when I was young, when I was about 19 years old, just wrestling with this idea. And he, he's like, I put that in your heart because I was wrestling with the idea of, at that time, I was a part of a denomination who didn't really believe in women in ministry. And, and at that time, he just brought up this, 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 this conversation in my heart. And I started thinking, if one of my sisters came to the same Bible, Bible school that I'm going through, and they, they finished the whole school... You know, and, and if they, um, because I was actually just taking the classes I wanted and the classes that I felt like were going to help me, I didn't have to finish. I knew that after I did those classes, I can come back to that, to that denomination I was a part of. And they were already telling me I, I, I can take over a church. They were, they, they were offering things, right? But I knew that if one of my sisters, they, they get, if, even if they graduated, if they, had, if they had a better character than I did, if they had more passion for God, if they were more anointed for God, it didn't really matter because they were girls. And I, and I remember just, and God just brought that memory in the dream, and he was saying, and he just said again, like, the race is not fair, right? Even if he anointed the person, we create many times systems in the church and out of the church that are not just, and if we're going to be about his race, we need to care about these things. If we're going to honor God, we're going to have to care about the injustices that are happening. We cannot just say, it's like, well, it's not my fault. I didn't, cre- I didn't create that system. We have to become part of the solution to restore and transform because he wants a fair race. What's the honor of winning the race? If you feel like you've won so much, but it's like the race was fixed. You know, it's like every good movie, there's something about even like the, the underdog, right? Even with all the obstacles, getting to win. But that happens sometimes. A lot of times, the underdog just loses. You know, in a dream, there was this place where I said, you know, because of disappointment, I stopped having the same passion to run and the same passion to win. And I, and I, and I said, and I, I need to get healed of that. But at the same time, we need to know that God wants everybody to win. He wants everybody to run the race with passion. He wants everybody to feel supported and cared for as we run. As a family, we, we, we need to be doing that. So... We're going to, if I can have the worship team back up here, we're going to close. And I want to read Psalms 100 as we go on this. You know, something interesting that I didn't realize until later was that actually 
the eight, the eight, when I woke up on the 18th, that was, it was the, it, we were celebrating 100 years from when, you know, the, the 19th Amendment and the Constitution, they, they were able to, um, you know, in, in Tennessee, you know, it became the 36th 30, state that, uh, that allowed uh, women to vote in this country. That's a huge thing. Why? Because it's valuing the voice of women in this country, right? Like that's, that, that shows value. And as Christians, we need to see the value that God sees in every person. Male, female, old, young. We need to learn to see with our Father's heart. And we need to be able to become instruments of transformation and change. You know, if we win, we got to win with honor. We need to be fast towards building peace. Towards running to heaven. Pursuing holiness in our life. Verse 2 says, As you serve him, be glad and worship him. Sing your way into his presence with joy. You know that I talked about how serving is an expression of a race. In a race, it's, it's, it's a race of serving, right? And it says that we're going to find gladness and joy in his presence as we do that. And realize that this really means we have the privilege of worshiping the Lord our God. For he is our creator and we belong to him. We are the people of his pleasure. This is why we run. You can pass through his open gates with the passport, the password of praise. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Come bring your thank offerings to him and affectionately bless his beautiful name. For the Lord is always good and ready to receive you. For the Lord is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that he will amaze you, so kind that he will stand you. And he's famous for his faithfulness towards all. Everyone knows our God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. He said he is famous for his faithfulness towards all. It's not enough that we are experiencing justice. God wants all to experience justice, right? Now, I, I want to pray as we're closing here today. I want to pray for us. God wants to heal you from wounds. Maybe you, you have experienced the injustice. Maybe even in the church, you experienced the injustice. And God wants to heal that today. He wants to give you grace. He wants his presence to come and restore divinely as you put your heart before him. He wants to break cycles of sin. He wants to help you to, to stop falling so you can run the way that you're supposed to run the race. Maybe he wants to give you fresh revelation of his love. Remind you why you run. 